Welcome to the Japanese History Podcast. Today's episode starts with a chronological overview of the history of Japan. Inspired by the great, great China History Podcast, we'll be taking a microscopic look at the entire history of the nation of Japan. We'll begin by taking a historical look at the first people of Japan, and then round back and check out the mythical beginnings of the land of the rising sun, with all its gods and spirits. Skipping over much of the Paleolithic Age, which we can sum up with humans arriving in Japan, starting to make simple tools and settling, we'll start our story in the year 14,000 BC. We'll have to resort to using the Gregorian calendar. The homegrown Japanese imperial calendar won't start until 660 BC, which is the imperially official starting signal for the nation of Japan. But where we're standing, there's not any nation of Japan, or any nation at all. It's a solid 11,000 years left until Japan's western neighbor, China, has its mythical first emperor, the Huangdi, Yellow Emperor. But enough about that. Let's get back to our island. Conversely, Japanese history is divided into ages, or periods, Jidai. They're more like the European ages, like the Middle Ages and Renaissance, than the Chinese dynasties, often divided by important events, rather which dynasty sits on the throne. A simple reason for that is that there's only ever been one dynasty on the chrysanthemum throne. But I digress, we'll get there. Our first period is the Jomon Jidai. At this time Japan was connected to the rest of Asia, and the people, they walked right in, settling the lands, hunting and gathering. And also made pottery. The main course consisted of chestnuts, fish and game, mainly boar and deer. The Jomon people centered mainly around the middle of Japan's largest island, Honshu but they ranged from the northern Hokkaido Isle to the Ryukyu Islands. Pottery was invented in China about 2000 years before the Jomon period started, but it really takes off in Japan with the Jomon people, they love it. Pottery develops at about the same pace in Japan as it does in the basin of the Amur River, a river in what is today Russia, right across the Sea of Japan. Pottery is a real telltale sign of sedentary living. No hunter-gatherer in his right mind would haul along a bunch of pottery. It's way too heavy and fragile. But apparently, food was so abundant in the archipelago, the Jomon didn't have to drop it all and move along to hunt deer in some distant place, but could just leisurely take time after their day to make pottery. Pretty quickly, this overabundance led to the people thinking, hey, why do you have to move around all the time to hunt and gather when I can just stay here? So they did. The Jomon people also took a liking to basic agriculture grown with things like gourds and pumpkins. They also tended groves of trees producing nuts. The Jomon people, who deserve an episode of their own, maybe we'll come back to that, continued to grow and develop. They were especially fond of peaches and cultivated them into a form very similar to the modern day peach. Their pottery became better and better. But all good things must come to an end. And with the largest population recorded for a people still into the hunter-gatherer game, the incipient Jomon periods ends. And the early Jomon period begins. In 4000 BC, it was pretty much smooth sailing for one and a half millennia for the Jomon. The good times kept on rolling and the population grew explosively. Another period passes by, and by 2500 BC, we've entered the Middle Jomon period. This is where the fun really begins. The Jomon have started making the famous Dogu clay figurines. They're small clay men standing around 30 centimeters tall, or 12 inches. But that's not all. They've also started living in huts, but not just any huts, but pit houses. These dugout small dwellings will serve as the main housing in northern Japan until the 13th century. That's a whopping 3,700 years of usage. Talk about stable architecture. Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Some of these houses even had a stone paved flooring. It's a pretty modern, sleek design. This really was the heyday of the Jomon people. Because as we near the end of the middle period, as 1500 BC, dark clouds are gathering on the horizon. That year, the climate started to cool, and the population began to decrease. And as if that's not enough, a new people reached the shores of Kyushu, the southernmost island, at around 900 BC. Little by little, these people started setting up shop on the west of the island, building houses above ground, just like in the Korean peninsula. During the next couple of centuries, the trade with the Korean mainland would increase dramatically, and this new people, the Yayoi, would get all the cool stuff, 
like bronze metallurgy and wet rice farming. These, in combinations, are great for making a populous and powerful tribal society. By 300 BC, this Yayoi had pushed the Yomon far to the north, and here we see a split between Hokkaido, the northernmost island, and the rest of Japan. In Hokkaido, the Yomon hang on by the skin of their teeth and continue their ways into the Tsoku Yomon period. In the rest of Japan, the people are turned Yayoi, and with that, the Yomon period ends and the Yayoi period begins. Otherwhere in the world, at 300 BC, in the Roman Republic, the Lex Ugulnia was passed, allowing the plebeian class to become priests. In China, who had already had a grand time nation building, the Zhou dynasty is collapsing into the Warring States period. And the ancient world is still dealing with the aftermath of the death of Alexander the Great, who kicked the bucket in 323 BC. Well, the Yayoi were here to stay, and they began building settlements by the rice fields. The Yayoi power structure was based on the ability to gather and store grain. The man with the most bronze and grain, he was the head honcho. The Chinese at this point described the Yayoi as tattooed and tribal. Life in Japan during this time seemed to get rougher, as with the collection of grains and taxes, the ownership of land and state building came in inevitable conflict. Settlements start to build palisades and some people build their homes far up into the mountains for protection. Bows, previously used mainly for hunting by the Yomon, became a primary weapon of war. The Japanese bow, the Yumi, has homegrown roots and was invented by the Yomon, all by themselves. For about 300 years this state of conflict increased, and so did the trade with the peninsular Korean Jin state, the Ryukyu tribes and China. Sometime, in the first century, the nation of Na, the very first nation on the archipelago, gained supremacy over the area around what is now the city of Fukuoka in northern Kyushu. The Na state, Nakoku, conducted trade with the Korean Three Kingdoms, and the good old China and Ryukyu trade still kept going. During this time, China was ruled by the Han Dynasty, a golden age, and their influence on the Yayoi was huge eclipsing the earlier Korean influence. The Han Emperor sent emissaries to the burgeoning states, and they sent tribute in return. The Na became a Han tributary, China's favorite type of foreign diplomacy. The Na were vassals to the Han, and their government was inspired by the Chinese. To the west of Na, another state was formed during the 1st and 2nd centuries, the Yamato, and with them the Wa people, or as they are known today, Japanese. That leads us into the Yamato period, which is beyond our scope for today. Now we have the general idea of how nations formed on the island, where the people came from, and how the culture evolved. Well, maybe not the last part, but we'll get to that eventually. Keep in mind we're just flying past in lightning speed. Now that that's over, we'll circle back around and discuss how the nation of Japan was formed by those of a more mystical persuasion. Let's use our newfound historical knowledge and you, the handsome and clever listener, can see where history and legend interact. So, Japan was founded by who else but the first Japanese emperor, Emperor Jinmu, Jinmu Tenno. Jinmu was born in 711 BC as the great grandson to Amaterasu, the sun goddess. He has three older brothers and they all lived in southern Kyushu. So, by our standards, might they have been Yomon? Jimu is always carrying his bow, a Yomon invention after all. So, this clan had grand plans to rule the entire archipelago. After all, they were the descendants of the sun goddess, so they had a pretty good claim. But, southern Kyushu wasn't really cutting it for them, and as we know, it's all location, location, location. So, they made a move to the east, vying for a more central position. They crossed the Seto Inland Sea, and Jinmu's older brother was killed in combat with the local clan around what is now Osaka, and were driven back into the sea. Jinmu, who was a pretty smart guy, figured they had lost because they invaded from the west, so the sun was in the rise. He went around the key peninsula, and invaded from the east. He was guided across the land by a three-legged crow, and defeated the clan that his brother had lost to previously. This land was called the Yamato. 
He became the emperor of Japan here and lived a long time, 127 years. Must be something in the water. He became emperor in 660 BC and left for the afterlife in 585. We'll get back to Emperor Jim in more detail later. I'm planning to do a series where we'll follow along with each emperor in more detail. That's right, all 126 of them. Next time we'll take a look at the Yamato period of Japan. Feel free to send in any topics that would like to be discussed and we'll get to it after the overview. And please correct me where I'm wrong as I undoubtedly will be from time to time. As they say, knowledge is infinite while life is finite. Not much else going on right now, so the next episode shouldn't take too long to come out. Sit tight, wonderful listener, and we'll see each other soon again. Bye-bye.